Okay, members, it's now time for questions to the Minister of Justice, and we start with the listed questions. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question one, please. Educating the public on how to keep safe online and prevent cybercrime is a high priority for government. The Get, the Get Safe Online website is an ongoing resource which provides advice, including a specific action, uh, section on safeguarding children. This year's Get Safe Online Day was the 18th of October, and an associated awareness campaign urged the public and small businesses to make every day safer by treating online security as essential life admin. I had the opportunity to visit the PSNI's e-crime centre, where it was clearly demonstrated that there, were or there are considerable challenges in safeguarding children and young people against the associated dangers of online exploitation and grooming. The Marshall Report into Child Sexual Exploitation contained recommendations from my department, including the need to examine a range of legislative issues. A review paper is currently under development. A range of protective measures are already in place, which include sexual offences prevention orders, statutory notification requirements and child protection disclosures. The Probation Board for Northern Ireland delivers a range of programmes to, uh, to convicted sexual offenders, one of which specifically targets those who have made, uh, possessed or distributed indecent images of children through electronic media. Placing and community safety partnerships across Northern Ireland also play a key role in educating our children and young people to stay safe online. Many, including those within the members' own constituency, will this year deliver a diverse range of initiatives in local schools and communities to keep children, young people and indeed their parents' awareness heightened to the dangers that can and do uh, lurk online. Call Sandra over in for supplementary. Very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the detail that she has outlined there. Uh, one of uh, the UK's most senior police officers has said that he believes that at least 100,000 100, men in the UK regularly look at obscene images of children online. Can the Minister really provide any assurances that she, her department, and indeed the executive, is increasing the prioritisation uh, of the safety of our young people and is investing real? online protection, investing in real online protection and the identification of such predators, especially considering that years after the call for a cross-departmental internet safety strategy, it still remains outstanding. I thank the member for her uh, question. Um, yes, I, I do believe there is a renewed focus on uh, child sexual ex exploitation, particularly in, in and around online um, uh, forms of this type of exploitation. Um, I, I, I do think that um, we are becoming more and more aware and apparent of, of the, the nature of these types of offences. The current legislation in place um, does um, enable um, these types of offences to be mitigated against, you know, such as the sexual offences order um, and uh, the, the, the disclosure scheme around sexual, uh, child sexual exploitation. But I do um, uh, take on board the members' comments that it's something I think that we continue, need to continue to have a, a, a focus on because um, at the end of the day, these are our children. And you know, often when we close, the, 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 the bedroom doors are closed. We're not always aware of what our children are doing, and I think um, we have a responsibility both within government but also um, as parents to, to ensure that um, we are keeping our children safe online. Um, I, th I think it was said that what is it, 70% of the population now access online uh, material, and you know, undoubtedly the majority of those are children and young people. So I, I think there, there is um, definitely um, a need to, to, to provide um, a, a more targeted focus and certainly when I visited the, the PSNI crime e-safety unit only last week. Um, that focus is, is, is happening but much more needs to be done. It's almost one of those issues that I'm not quite sure we will ever get on top of because it's so, uh, so uh, colossal but um, I do think as a government we, we, we are looking towards how, how we can uh, mitigate this in, in as many circumstances as possible. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, just following on uh, from the Minister has just discussed there, this week is Parenting NI, uh, week when it's discussing online digital safety, especially for teenagers. But I'm wondering um, if the Minister could confirm what correspondence has she had with the Cyber Crime Unit about what changes in legislation are needed to combat increasingly difficult challenges from this sort of crime, and how well that will be communicated to parents to ensure that they can support teenagers to stay safe online. 
I thank the member for her question. Um, I, I've had no specific um, uh, suggestions about what legislation that we, we, we need to, to, to put in place to, to better um, tackle this type of issue. However, I do agree that this is a multi-agency approach, not only with the PSNI, but also within our schools, within uh, the Department of Communities, Department of Health. I think we need to look at all these um, different departments and see where, where, this, um, where these types of crimes can um, impregnate themselves, and particularly amongst our children and young people. Um, um, I do appreciate the member for highlighting uh, uh, this important week around parenting. Um, I do think parents and families have a responsibility to try and understand what their children and young people are doing whilst they're online. Um, and it's not always easy. You know, um, we conduct a lot of our activity on smartphones, um, and children, you know, I'm sure, don't often like you looking over their shoulder, but I think there needs to be a sense of trying to educate uh, children and young people to the dangers that they do face once, whilst they're online. Um, that will be not something government can do alone, and indeed they need to support parents in doing that. So, um, nothing as yet, but um, I'm keen to, to look at this. Other members have raised it with me, um, and I, I do think it's one of these issues that, um, unless we start tackling it now, it might be difficult to get on top of at a later date. I call Mike Nesbitt. Question two, Deputy Speaker. The Northern Ireland Prison Service takes the duty of care for all individuals it holds in custody extremely seriously. Identifying and supporting prisoners with mental health issues during custody remains a priority for the Northern Ireland Prison Service. And since becoming Minister, I have instructed officials to ensure that focus on addressing prisoner and prison officer mental health remains at the forefront of their work moving forward. The prison population stood at 1,499 on the 16th of October 2016. 391 prisoners were recorded as having been diagnosed with a mental health issue on that date, 26 per cent of the prison population. So there is an obvious uh, problem here and something that we need to give full consideration to. Within the overall prison population, there were 1,107 sentenced prisoners and of this number, 173 were recorded as having a mental illness. Prison Service and the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust, which is responsible for the delivery of health care in prisons, are committed to providing effective services to vulnerable people in custody. The Minister of Health and I visited High Bank Wood on the 27th of September to discuss health issues in prisons, particularly of mental health. And I will continue to work with Minister O'Neill to ensure that children, young people and adults in the criminal justice system are healthier, safer and less likely to be involved in offending behaviour. Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. Uh, I, th I thank the Minister, if I heard it correctly, it, it sounds as if there is a suspicion that maybe uh, one in four people uh, are in the criminal justice system who perhaps should not be because of their mental health and well-being. Can I ask the Minister, is she considering a multi-agency approach? For example, I think the PSNI would argue that sometimes they go to their scene, lift somebody and put them in a cell and therefore into the criminal justice system where they, the proper path uh, for the benefit of that individual and therefore for society lies elsewhere. I thank the member for his comments and indeed his question. And Tara, there needs to be a multi-agency approach, approach on how we tackle mental health, not just for those uh, finding themselves within custody, but right at the beginning of the criminal justice uh, process. And that does begin with the police, but we also need to feed that through and how they, you know, within courts, perhaps uh, before a conviction has even taken place. But then if that results uh, to a, a, a sentence of custody, how we deal with prisoners whilst they're in our care. And then afterwards, because prisoners, you know, uh, prison sentence are not indefinite and they will eventually come out into society and for the uh, best interests of a safer community we need to ensure that we have rehabilitated um, not just in terms of their behaviour but, ar but around their, their health as well. So indeed there does have to be um, a, a multi-agency approach on how we uh, tackle mental health issues within prisons. Indeed I recently met with um, a forensic mental health team within the Northern Trust and indeed a lot of the work that they are doing um, is, is a good model of how we could move forward in this area so I look forward to seeing how we can explore that further. Iram Sir, Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given the acute issues around mental health in our prisons and across society in general, has the minister, can the minister advise of any details of any new bid for increased monies to address mental health issues as part of the proposal to deal with the past? 
thank the member for, his, uh, for her question. Um, not as yet, no, I, I haven't um, received any sort of bids in that particular area. Um, but I do think uh, the member raises a really important point. Um, I, I think I've said it in this House before that um, one of our biggest legacies of the past is mental health. The, the troubles in Northern Ireland were a deep trauma for everyone involved, um, those directly and those indirectly. And I think we do need to focus on the fact that, that there will be outworkings of that happening now, particularly when a lot of people are now in retirement and are starting to think about those particular issues. I haven't had a particular bid in that area, but I am interested to see how this area of work de develops. Alongside with uh, the Health Minister, did this um, um, is particularly her area, and when it, fall when it comes into the justice uh, system, it, it, it then crosses over into my remit. However, I think together, whether it's health, whether it's justice, indeed communities, education, we all we, we need to be having a, a, an interdepartment uh, approach to mental health. Um, and outside of the executive and this house as well. We need to be looking at agencies, we need to be looking at our communities and see how we can best tackle this moving forward. Um, you know, I, I am quite heartened, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the, the conversations we're having around mental health because I think it's important because too often it's forgotten, forgotten about and I, indeed since uh, the beginning of this term I think there has been a, a focus on it and, and you know, it can only be a good thing because there are uh, significant mental health problems throughout society, not least in my prisons, um, and if we were to address them then we could address, uh, address uh, significant wider societal problems. Call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Would the Minister agree with me that mental health issues um, don't just stop um, in, in the prison when a prisoner gets out, but they're transferred in the community where the families when that prisoner is released? But also, could she look at the, at the work that the Probation Board for Northern Ireland is, is doing um, with, with uh, clients in terms of mental health? I uh, thank the member for his question. Indeed, the Probation Board do fantastic word, uh, work in preparing prisoners uh, upon their release. And indeed, mental health doesn't uh, begin and um, by coming into prison. Indeed, you know the structure of prison in itself can help. Uh, um, regulate some of the mental health problems, uh, namely through medication. However, it does take a wider approach than that, um, perhaps through other uh, types of therapy for mental health. And the difficulty I suppose I have is that when uh, prisoners are released back into the communities after serving uh, uh, their, their time within custody, um, that they're almost going back to square one because those uh, support mechanisms are not necessarily in place when, whilst they're, when they go back in uh, to the community, therefore increasing their chances of reoffending. Um, so in terms in terms of my approach to mental health alongside the health minister, I'd be quite keen to begin with a preventative approach, perhaps even looking should we be sending people into prison at all with severe mental health issues, um, looking at the support available when they are in custody, and then that post-custody uh, approach to ensure that they don't re-offend and that vicious circle begins all over again. Because it helps no one, it doesn't help wider society, it causes a lot of problems. From a pragmatic point of view, it wastes an awful lot of resources and money. And I think there is a responsibility on this government to really address it quite seriously. Thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister tell us what provision exists to support prisoners with autism or ADHD? Uh, when prison, uh, prisoners come into custody, um, their, their circumstances are assessed whilst they're in prison. Um, um, I, I'm not quite sure what the provision exists, if I'm really honest, in, in relation to autism and ADHD, um, which perhaps suggests that the, the provision isn't quite satisfactory in terms of that area. Um, I would be keen that we do look at this. Um, again, mental health are not the only reason that leads uh, people to offending within society. Issues of learning disability, autism, ADHD should be considered as well. And indeed, um, uh, the forensic mental health team that I, I alluded to earlier, I met with them from the Northern Trust. They do look at all these issues because they themselves are coming from a multi-agency approach. So it's not just about uh, clinical care of mental health through um, various prescribed drugs. It's also the therapy of mental health. It's also their, their environment, their circumstances. So occupational um, uh, therapy will be in there as well. Um, but no, I, I entirely agree with the member. You know, I, I am of the belief that no one is born bad. It, it tends to be a product of their circumstances and their upbringing. And I think if we can tackle those issues upstream, then perhaps we won't have people offending in the first place. And certainly if we can tackle them whilst they're in our custody, hopefully we will not have them reoffending when they, when they are released. Called Paula Bradshaw. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, just to follow on actually from that last point you made, could you give us some specifics around proposals you're bringing forward um, for those to diagnose and treat those people within the youth justice system so they don't become pr adult prisoners of the future? Thank the, the member for her question. Um, uh, conversations around uh, children and young people within our cr uh, criminal justice systems are at a very early stage. I have, however, met with the health minister to, to look at this particular issue um, because I do actually believe that uh, taking children and young people into the criminal justice system could actually act as a detriment and begin a spiral of destruction that, again, is not helping that individual. It's not helping wider society in terms of a safer community. Um, but it's also causing a lot of other right, wider repercussions. Um, I'm not quite sure how that will look. Um, I, I am keen to develop it and see if, if there's a need and a necessity there. I think we do also have to bear in mind, though, that the, the point of uh, sentencing and people coming into custody, and it is around, it's finding that balance between rehabilitation, but also to, in a sense, uh, to be held to account for offences that they have taken, um, which makes this issue really quite difficult. But you know, I, I think you know it would be remiss of us if we didn't look at it because I think we see the outworkings of the current system and, frankly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not quite sure it's good enough. David Hilditch is in his place. I call, therefore, Steve Aiken. Deputy Speaker, I could ask the Minister for Justice for an up oh, sorry, question number four. My fault, my son. Uh, thank you, uh, the member. Um, I am committed to reducing expenditure on legal aid through a range of measures to tackle demand and the cost of individual cases. I am currently bringing forward proposals to introduce a standardised fee structure for legal representatives in family cases, and I am conducting a review of the cost of expert witnesses, and I am making some adjustments in the types of cases which can be uh, funded through legal aid. The proposals will build on changes which have already uh, been implemented, including reduced fees in the criminal courts and measures to ensure that the appropriate level of representation is granted in civil and criminal courts. Administration costs are being addressed through a transformation programme in the Legal Services, uh, Services Agency, which includes a digitalisation programme. I am considering the recommendations in Access to Justice 2 and will bring forward an updated strategy for legal aid. I will also consider any relevant recommendations from the Gillen Review to ensure that we take a, strate a, tr a strategic approach to reform. Legal aid is demand-led and exists to provide support for the most vulnerable in society to get access to justice. Last year, the budget provided for over 90,000 acts of assistance. Steve Egan for a supplementary. Uh, I apologise for my earlier uh, schedule. It's slightly wrong. I uh, could ask the uh, uh, Minister, uh, given recent high-profile cases, including that of Hazel Stewart, where over allegedly 600,000 has been spent on legal aid. Does the minister agree that more must be done to restore public confidence in the legal aid system? Thank you. I uh, thank the member for his question. Um, I'm sure the, uh, the member will appreciate that it, you know, I, it would be inappropriate for me to, to comment on individual cases, but I do take the point that there has been a lot of conversation around the cost of legal aid, and indeed the bill is significant. Um, I suppose some could say that that might demonstrate um, that we are providing access to justice in, in all these uh, types of cases. Um, but it, you know, I, I do think it is something that we need to look at in, in a wider uh, in a wider context. Indeed, the Access to Justice Review uh, Part 2 um, enables to do that, and any other reviews, um, as I had mentioned around the Gillen Review, is something that we should also uh, take into account. But um, I, I, I am very aware of the public perception around legal aid, and I, I'm working towards seeing how I, I can do something to, to, uh, to uh, ensure that public confidence. Thank you. I call Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Um, the Minister has indicated um, her uh, intention to introduce, to introduce a domestic violence offence. Um, I'm just wondering if the Minister could uh, tell us what impact that might have on the legal aid bill and when she, uh, if she has any timelines for introducing the offence. Um, in, in terms of the offence, it's something I, I'm working to. Um, I give myself a, a very um, definite timetable in, in relation to the domestic violence offence, but it's one that I'm really uh, confident that I will meet. Um, in how uh, that will affect legal aid budget, um, it's really around the access to justice um, uh, uh, provision of legal aid and to ensure that the most vulnerable within um, our society does get that access to justice. So I would imagine it will um, be facilitated in a similar way to, to, to other uh, cases. Here, Ms. Sarah Michaela Boyle. Uh, Minister, can you confirm that plans to reduce the cost of legal aid will not in any way impede um, 
proper access to justice uh, for all sections of society. Um, I, I thank the member for her question. Um, and as outlined earlier, um, I suppose we need to almost reframe the message of um, legal aid and the purpose of it. And indeed, um, from my perspective, uh, legal aid uh, should be uh, the resort of access to justice um, for the most vulnerable within our society. Indeed, that is the focus that um, myself and my department are putting towards legal aid to ensure that those um, who uh, require um, access to justice, you know, uh, should indeed get it. Um, I think, um, however, to, ba to balance that particular argument, you know, it, it's, some would say that this is access to justice, others would say that this is a significant uh, bill within my budget, and indeed that, that's correct. And it is a case of, you know, we have to try and ensure that, you know, we can meet within our budget, and indeed this year, you know, we're quite confident that we can do that. But I think overall we have to ensure that this is about access to justice. The figure in itself is, is quite significant, but perhaps we should look at that in a way that we are, uh, it's demand-led, and we are, uh, we are satisfying access to justice in that respect. Here and Sir Alex Atwood, I call Alex Atwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister to give a firm personal commitment here and now to uh, the funding, the legal aid funding for the Family Court? Uh, the Minister has made issues of abuse and trauma priorities for her. If the funding for the Family Court is undermined, then vulnerable families, parents, children will be put in jeopardy. Will you give that firm personal commitment to funding for the Family Court? thank the member for his question and indeed the member as a member of the Justice Committee will be familiar with the challenges that I faced in terms of legal aid. Um, as I have already reiterated a number of times, it, it is a challenge, it's a significant amount of budget. Um, but as, as, as I have uh, said to other members, it is about access to justice and you know, uh, providing that access to justice uh, to the most vulnerable within our society and that's something that I am keen to move forward with. I call Claire Bailey. Um, has the Minister got any figures at all for how many um, cases have been rejected um, under legal aid since the implementation of the budget cuts? Thank the, the member for her question. Um, I, I wouldn't say that anything has been uh, rejected in respect of the budget cuts. Um, there is a budget, it's demand led, and if uh, those cases that are brought for, uh, forward um, satisfy the criteria for legal aid, they will get it. it um, I, I wouldn't uh, suggest that anything has been rejected due to budget cuts. <clears throat> Here, I'm sure, Justin McNulty. I call Justin McNulty for quit. Question number five. <clears throat> The Stormont House Agreement was an agreement between the Northern Ireland Executive and the British and Irish governments. Since coming to office, I have been in discussion with, the, with executive colleagues and the United Kingdom government to ensure delivery of the justice elements of that agreement. In particular, discussions have fo uh, focused on the remaining policy issues that lie behind the development of the draft bill to deliver the Stormont House Agreement. Members will recognise that, with, as with any policy development, ministers require the space and time to develop thinking and establish policy proposals. Once the policy position is sufficiently advanced, I, along with the First uh, Minister and Deputy First Minister, will be in a position to discuss our agreed position. I call Justin McNulty for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer thus far. Can I ask the Minister if justice officials have been meeting NAO officials for months on the implementation of and legislation around legacy proposals? Does the Minister agree that devolution and openness is undermined when the Minister refers any questions to her? and her department's work to the NIO rather than give answers to the people of the North. Um, as always, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm quite happy to provide answers to, to the people of Northern Ireland. However, um, just to provide clarity to the member who, who has raised the question, um, the, the, the draft legislation in relation to the, the historical inquiries unit um, is led by the UK government. Um, and I think it's the most appropriate thing for me, to, for me to lead any questions in that respect because I do not speak for the Northern Ireland office, or nor, nor do I speak for the UK executive. I speak for the Department of Justice. Um, yes, I will confirm also that we have been meeting regularly and how we can progress this issue. I'm very much of the mindset that we do need to progress this issue. Um, it was agreed in the Stormont House uh, Agreement. It's the only show in town. Um, and I believe it's the best way of addressing our past. Here I'm Sir Kiva Archibald. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, can I ask, I thank the Minister for her answer so far, and can I ask her, um, has she challenged the NIO to release funding for the Lord Chief Justice's five-year plan for legacy inquests? and pointed out that the British government is in breach of Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights by not doing so. 
thank the, the member for her question. Um, indeed, I, I think it's, um, I've said publicly on a number of occasions that I indeed support the mechanism which the Lord Chief Justice has proposed in terms of uh, trying to bring a conclusion the number of legacy inquests that um, will, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, go ahead um, regardless um, if we find a solution to do it in a, in a shorter period of time. Um, but as, as I have said to this House before, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, do we want to address this in five years or do we want to address this in 25 years? And I think um, our approach to addressing legacy is ultimately about uh, the victims and their families. And we are, we are time bound by that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So I would be keen to ensure that we move forward on this as soon as uh, possible so that we can move on and we can provide some uh, sort of answers to, to the victims of our past. I call Danny Kennedy. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Will the Minister agree that, that, that the current mechanisms for dealing with the past operate uh, in an incomplete, imperfect and imbalanced manner would serve only to rewrite history and uh, uh, disproportionately focus uh, on the State? Uh, will she give an assurance to the House that she will not permit this to continue? <clears throat> I thank the member for his question. Indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it would be my preferred option that we um, address uh, the HIU and the legacy inquests in parallel and move forward together. Um, I, I, I'm not of the, the mind in terms of uh, when we talk about victims. I've met with a number of uh, victims in the, since becoming minister, and um, every one of them is not telling me that their hurt or their pain is any greater than anyone else. They just want answers, and that seems to be the case um, right across uh, the, the communities and, and the, 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 the people that I've met um, in, in the past six months. Um, so from my perspective, I, I do think we need to progress on this. We need to progress in terms of addressing our legacy inquests, which are progressing already, just in, at a very, very slow pace, but we also need to uh, get the HIU up and running as soon as we can. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On June 21st of this year, the Justice Minister said that as a result of the support she had from the First Minister and the commitment of this executive to work together, she was confident of progressing funding for the Lord Chief Justice's proposals uh, to grant inquests into the deaths of loved ones that have been denied for decades. Can I ask the Justice Minister how credible is that support and that commitment given the First Minister's ongoing veto of these legacy inquest proposals? Thank the member for his question. Um, certainly in any discussions that I've had, um, I can reiterate my confidence that we will progress on legacy inquests. Um, it has always been a case uh, for me when that will be. Um, I am hopeful that it will happen as soon as possible. I, I'm afraid I can't give you a time frame because I, I am unsure and negotiations are ongoing or discussions are ongoing around these particular issues. Um, but I do have confidence that we will move forward on this. Um, I think um, post uh, the May election, you know, we, we are in a very different political space. I think there's a keenness to try and address the challenges that you know, we find within the Northern Ireland Executive, but also to try and deliver and get things done. So I do think the opportunity exists now that perhaps didn't exist before. So um, I am confident that we will move forward on this. I call Jim Allister for question. Six. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to say up front that any attack on any symbolic building is unacceptable. And I'm aware that there have been a number of attacks on premises right across Northern Ireland, some of which have been investigated as hate crimes by the PSNI. At a strategic level, my department is committed to tackling hate crime from the criminal justice perspective through the delivery of the executive's community safety strategy and works with a range of statutory, voluntary and community organisations to take this work forward. At an operational level, I understand that the PSNI has a control strategy dealing with attacks on symbolic buildings and that patrols pay attention to such buildings um, in itself. In addition, policing and community safety partnerships, which are jointly funded by my department and the Northern Ireland Policing Board, work at a local level to develop solutions to local issues and to enhance community safety. Information on prosecutions and conviction dat data sets within my department is sourced from ICOS, the Northern Ireland Court and Tribunal Service, Information's Management System. Within this system, information on the type of building which may have been attacked is only held in the detail of charges for which an individual is prosecuted at court, which is not searchable in an automated way. Therefore, it would only be possible to identify prosecutions or convictions resulting from attack on symbolic buildings through a manual trawl of court records. 
Offences committed in relation to such attacks may be criminal damage or arson, of which there are a number prosecuted at court each year. For example, in 2015, there were 1,908 convictions where at least one offence was that of criminal damage. While only a small percentage of these will relate to attacks on symbolic buildings, given the number of cases involved, a search of these rec records would incur a disproportionate cost. I have time for a very quick supplementary and a very quick response to you, if it can. Is it not quite appalling that, having been able in another answer to indicate there have been 132 attacks in Orange Halls in the last five years, that the Minister cannot tell this House uh, there, how many prosecutions there have been? Is that because of embarrassment? Surely, if there is a spreadsheet showing the number of attacks, there must be a column, so to speak, that shows if anyone was prosecuted or brought to justice. Is the Minister too embarrassed to tell us? <clears throat> Uh, no, indeed, I'm not embarrassed to tell you. You know, I think the people who commit these crimes should certainly be embarrassed, and it's something that I um, do uh, uh, condemn. You know, the, these types of uh, attacks. Um, you know. Whatever their intention may be, are apparent. Um, it, it's not the case that I'm too embarrassed to tell. I can confirm that it would be at a disproportionate cost that we cannot provide the figures. Um, I'm not quite sure why the, the member is so uh, focused on the figures in particular. I think the point he raises is a good one in that these attacks are happening and they're continuing to happen. And around hate crime, we, we need to look at the reasons why and see how we can best address these moving forward. Okay, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, has the Minister been briefed by our officials on any possible implications to Northern Ireland on the second reading of the Criminal Finances Bill 2016-2017 in Westminster tomorrow? Um, no, I, I cannot confirm that I, I, I um, can recall any such brief, briefing, but um, truthfully, it could be my own ignorance in that respect. But um, I will come back to the, the member with a uh, response as soon as I get it. Steve Egan, for a supplementary. I'm sure, uh, Minister, it's not your own ignorance. I imagine that if it was brought before you, you would have been fully aware of it. Uh, could I then ask the Minister if she could make representation to the Home Secretary to ascertain when, where, whether any of the nine billion currently being sequestrated in the UK belonging to the Lib Libyan regime can be used to compensate the victims of IRA violence, the IRA who, and the Republican terrorists who still are, using weapons and explosives provided by the Gaddafi regime. Yes, I, I, I'm quite, quite happy to take that request forward and, and see what uh, response we can get. Thank you. Catherine Seeley for your cash. I call Catherine Seeley for a question. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her responses so far. Can I ask the Minister if she would support or refuse into Part 111 of the Public Order NI Order 1987 Act, which is in relation to acts likely to stir up hatred or arouse fear, following recent comments from the Chief Constable that the legislative framework would benefit from a uh, review which he would support? Um, I can uh, thank the member for her question. I can confirm to the member that um, I have not had conversations uh, with the Chief Constable around this particular issue. Um, however, further to her question today, I am quite happy uh, to raise it um, as a matter of interest to this House. Catherine Seeley for a supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for her answer and, and indeed for her honesty. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, following that conversation, um, if she would um, come back to us to, to just to, to explain whether she would intend to initiate a review of the concerned legislative framework? Yes, um, um, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to come back to this House. Thank you. Barry McElduff, on your case, I call Barry McElduff for a question. Can I ask the Minister if uh, she and her department value the role of volunteers in safer street projects in various towns? Um, I thank the, the member for his uh, question. Indeed, you know, I value the role of all uh, volunteers and uh, people coming from the community and voluntary sector. I'm a big advocate of the community and voluntary sector because I believe those people are best placed in terms of the, the, their communities to know what's best uh, for the people that they're working on on a voluntary basis. Um, so yes, I, 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 I very much do support the work of um, all volunteers and certainly as a government um, we are neither placed um, or perhaps even have the, the, uh, the exhaustive resources to, to provide a lot of services ourselves. So I think it's appropriate that we do look towards the community and voluntary sector to see how we can uh, better um, produce public services um, that, uh, that, 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 that the art that Northern Ireland expects of us. Barry McElduff for supplementary. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I inform the Minister that 
uh, the town of Oma has recently achieved purple flag status, a uh, safer town in relation to evening entertainment, etc. And this is not least down to the voluntary efforts of Oma Safer Streets project. But could I ask the Minister perhaps to initiate discussions with the project leaders and with Fermanagh and Oma District Council regarding funding difficulties that they are having at this time? Um, I thank the, the member for his question. Um, indeed, um, a congratulations to OMA for this particular initiative. Um, you know, I think, again, the role of uh, the local government and, uh, and indeed the community and voluntary sector around um, finding solutions to the problems that we find on, you know, in our local communities is indeed um, a, a, a very apt way to, to approach the this type of tackling uh, crime, whether it's antisocial behaviour, whether it's other forms of crime. Um, yes, indeed, I'm, I'm quite happy to speak to anyone. I think it's important that we do listen to a lot of the stakeholders involved. Again, I'll reiterate, um, the community and voluntary sector know their communities best, um, and I think it would be remiss of us not to, to take that view into account. So, yes, happy to. I call Rosemary Barton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for your answers this, thus far. Uh, Minister, presently Enniskillen Courthouse is only open two to three days per week for court hearings. Is this the start of the process of closure by stealth? Um, no, um, certainly not the, the, the process of closure by stealth. Um, that, that wouldn't be my intention at all. Um, um, but as the member will be aware, and as I've reiterated into this House time and time again, uh, the, the court closures are subject to um, a judicial review, which actually will be heard this week. And I imagine the outcome of that uh, will be heard sometime later. So uh, until um, I am aware of the outcome of that particular judicial review, it would be inappropriate for me to comment further on courthouse and, and the closures around it. Rosemary Barton for supplementary. Yeah. So, Minister, you cannot categorically give an assurance to the people of Fermanagh that this courthouse will not close within the next five years. Um, I, I cannot give comment um, to any aspect of the, the court um, uh, estate um, pending the judicial review uh, inquiry, um, but whenever that has come to a conclusion, um, I'm quite happy to um, have a conversation with the member um, around the issues that she raises. I call George Robinson for a question. Thank you, Mr. De Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister outline what action her department has taken since closing Foilview buildings at HMP McGilligan after asbestos was discovered? I thank the member for his question and can indeed for, uh, confirm that the foil view uh, was closed um, due to the discovery of asbestos in that particular prison. Um, it, it was. Uh, it was um, we were able to, to move um, people within that particular facility into other parts of the prison, so it hasn't had a huge detrimental effect. However, I do think um, it um, consolidates the view that we, we need to look forward to a new build at McGilligan. Indeed, that's something that I've always been committed to, towards, but again, that will be subject to uh, the appropriate funding um, that we can secure. George Robinson for supplementary. The Minister for her answer. And can the Minister state if any other buildings at HMP McGilligan were found to contain asbestos? Um, not that I'm aware of, but um, I'm happy to, to come back to an answer in, in case that, you know, that, that there was any uh, such um, issues to be found in other buildings. Iram, sir, Philip McGuigan for your cash. I call Philip McGuigan for a question. Cara Milgut, uh, last can call you. Uh, given that at the end of September this year, in total there were 104 prisoners serving a sentence of six months or less, can I ask the Minister what kind of educational or behavioural change programmes are available for such prisoners during their short sentences? I thank the, the member for his question, um, and indeed he will appreciate that it is very difficult um, to re rehabilitate um, uh, prisoners within custody um, who are serving such short sentences, um, and indeed the number of challenges around uh, resources and putting effect effective plans into place to ensure that nature of re rehabilitation um, is, is really quite difficult. So I, I think it's something that we need to look at to, to ensure that um, whilst they're in our custody, you know, in a lot of cases for a short period of time, what programmes we can put in place to ensure that type of rehabilitation. Ultimately, rehabilitation is um, for the safer community um, because no sentence, whether it's six months or whether it's six years or 60 years, um, wouldn't be, but um, they will come back into custody or come back out, out into the community and we need to ensure that they're being rehabilitated so ultimately that they won't re-offend again. I call Phil Wiggins for a supplement. 
Uh, Gurram Elgut, and given the fact uh, that the Minister has said that it's something that she plans to look at, can I ask, do you plan to introduce uh, measures that will enable the administration of effective community sentences as a preferred option of dealing with those who would otherwise receive a short uh, custodial sentence? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think alongside um, agencies like the Probation Board, um, we can look at how we can better prepare uh, prisoners for when they come back into the community. And the Probation Board um, do a lot of fantastic work in this area and on, on looking at the special individual circumstances of each offender. And um, I suppose then as looking at the community that they will then uh, come out into. So, you know, I think it's important that there is a focus on anyone who's within the prison service um, because, again, this is about safer communities and it's also about limiting the opportunities opportunities for re-offending um, and indeed the probation, uh, the probation board are successful in doing so but it is limited and there, there is more work that needs to be done and it's something that I'm quite keen to look at. As Keith Buchanan and John O'Dowd aren't in their places and I share them, Sir Carol Nicholin when you cast, I call Carol Nicholin for a question. Gormelgut, I will ask Hank Collier. It's really to ask the Minister about the young people in our juvenile justice centre. So you've had a significant reduction in summer education hours from 22 and a half hours to 15 hours per week. And just if the minister could give assurances uh, that this won't have um, a huge impact on young people when they return, hopefully, to mainstream education. Um, yes, I, I, I take the, the member's point around education whilst they, they are in custody. Um, I think education, particularly for young people, is quite critical in, in trying to rehabilitate um, that, that type of behaviour. Um, I, I do have issues around the fact that we you know, take uh, children young people into the criminal justice system um, and we need to provide that support that when they do come back out into the community, they, they are not falling behind because I suppose that points to a wider societal problem if that be the case. So certainly um, along with um, the, the education minister and the health minister we are looking at children and young people within custody and looking at the appropriate measures in place to better support them. Um, education needs to be um, central to all of those things um, because then it will uh, reduce the likelihood of reoffending and give them better opportunities when they come out, better opportunities for employment. We find that people who have those opportunities for uh, employment are less li likely to, to reoffend. Um, so it's something that we need to put a focus on and indeed uh, within Hyde Bank Road there has been a programme that has certainly <coughs> focused around education but that's something that we need to strengthen and we need to look at that within uh, the, the, the uh, woodlands as well. Caroline Hillen for a supplementary. I thank, I thank the Minister for a comprehensive response and I suppose I will write to her at a later stage particularly about around some of the details of that translation process but she's partly answered it in terms of what details there are for children and young people going through the criminal justice system, but also to make sure that even for children who aren't academically inclined, that there's opportunities around vocational training and education for them as well. Yes, um, I think that that's entirely the right approach. Um, you know, too often we, we associate education with academia, and not everyone is um, academically minded, and that's that's perfectly fine. Um, indeed, we need we need to look at the, the vocational opportunities, and indeed some of those initiatives already do happen uh, within the custody arrangements, and often um, are the ones that are deemed to be quite successful. But no, certainly I, I think we, we have to look at how we can better strengthen that to, to provide the skills. You know that uh, when uh, young people are coming out of custody that. The do have a better opportunity and that you know to, to me that's the best outcome for all. Aram Sir Declan McAleer for Hunya Cash. I call Declan McAleer for a question. Uh, uh, could the Minister inform us what aspects of mental health care in prisons uh, in prison would does she hope to prioritise to the project advisory group which is responsible for public protection matters? I, I thank the, the member for his question. Um, indeed um, I, I think the issues around mental health within prisoners, both for, pris uh, for, uh, for within prisons, both for prisoners and prison officers, is something that has been given a renewed focus since I've become justice minister and since uh, the new uh, minister of health has taken post. And um, as I've reiterated many, many times, um, I, I'm pleased at that approach because a lot of the issues that we find within our prisons um, are primarily down to mental health, addiction problems, um, learning disabilities, uh, as we discussed earlier. Um, I was uh, quite pleased to meet um, with a group I've mentioned it a number of times already, uh, forensic mental health, um, who look at the very special, uh, 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 specific circumstances of people finding themselves within custody. And indeed, those arrangements are particularly for people with severe mental health issues. Issues. But you know, I think there could be perhaps an opportunity to, to extend that to, to all people coming uh, to uh, within uh, prisons. 
Um, and again, it's, it's not just about the health care they receive, it's the, it's the wider um, support that they also receive, whether that's in terms of the social care aspect, um, whether that's in terms of the environment which they're living within. Again, it has to be a before, during and after approach. Um, people are coming into our uh, health system with mental health issues. Um, whilst they're there, those are often being manifested because being in prison is not an easy environment, and I'm sure that you know um, we can all appreciate that. Coming out of prison is that probably the critical stage because we're, we're almost putting prisoners back to square one. If um, if we're sending them out in, uh, into the communities again, and those support systems are not a um, mechanism, we're, we're pulling the rug from beneath them. Essentially, that, that you know we've worked hard to put in place. So I think there needs to be a threefold approach: um, beginning, middle, and end. Um, and this won't be an end for you know for an awful lot of uh, people who find themselves within the criminal justice system. So. I, I am, I'm really uh, quite pleased that the, the Minister of Health has made it one of her priorities and certainly uh, moving forward it, it, it will be one of mine. Oh, we have time for a quick supplementary and a quick answer. Um, well, I note and welcome the, the, the very good joint work that the Minister is doing with her counterpart, the Minister for Health, uh, and dealing with the mental health care needs of people who are in prison. Could you tell me, um, have they been or are concerned looking at support for young people who have got ADHD and autism who are imprisoned? Karen Margaret. Yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, we, we do often talk about mental health. When I talk about mental health, I look at... Um, the specific issues of mental health, but almost uh, mental um, disorders in itself, which will include autism and ADHD, which um, sometimes can be seen as behavioural disorders. But I do think they are a contributory factor into why people offend and the difficulties they have um, whilst they're in prison and then potentially re-offend when they come out of prison. So I, I think we have to have more of a holistic approach to this. Um, but it, I think it is a good sign, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we, we are now having this focus um, because hopefully this upstream approach will, will ensure that it doesn't actually get downstream. Okay, time is up. We now move to questions.